the classes that you took that you don't remember at all. But going to Australia and driving your car across a continent under the power of the sun and only under the power of the sun together with your friends is a defining experience that you will remember until the day you die. So I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, we're here to celebrate the Stanford Solar Car Project. The Stanford Solar Car Project was founded in 1989 here at Stanford by some really driven engineering students. It's an entirely student-run group. What we do is we design, build, test, and then finally race solar-powered vehicles. So we compete every two years in something known as the World Solar Challenge. It's a really large event held in Australia. We are required to drive through the outback, just using solar power alone. It's a really competitive event. It's really difficult. This past race was one of the most exciting in our recent history. Our latest car, Luminos, which raced in the 2013 World Solar Challenge, this very grueling race, it did very well. We're here at the start of the 2013 World Solar Challenge. Over the next uh, around 2,000 miles across the Australian Outback, we think we have a very robust vehicle that's also efficient. Uh, so we're looking for a uh, top five finish, hopefully, in this year's race. The race itself has teams from about uh, over 20 other countries. It allows you to see that there are like uh, really good engineers and meet really good engineers from every country and every continent in the world. And I really think that's a really cool part of the experience. This year we had uh, 15 or 16 team members in race. I do love World Solar Challenge. It's so pure as a race. Just point A to point B, first one there wins. Uh, point A to point B happen to be 2,000 miles apart across the most inhospitable land on the planet. I love that. I found that I really like collaborative engineering. I have a lot of fun because I get to work with a, real, a lot of really smart people at Stanford. Um, I'm a rising sophomore at Stanford. I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. Try going a little, like a few degrees more vertical. Okay, you stop. I've actually taken three quarters off for solar car. I will finish in five years, which will be 12 quarters of school. I'll be a fifth year senior when I get back from this race in computer science. So I'm an economics major at Stanford, and uh, I've been spending the last uh, two years working on this vehicle, Luminos, and I also raced with the team in 2011. There are three classes that compete in the World Solar Challenge. The class that we competed in is the Challenger class, and that is straightforward racing. You have one person in the car, you're trying to go as fast as you can. All the teams uh, begin in Darwin, uh, which is on the northern coast of Australia. The teams are racing head-to-head -to, -head to Adelaide, which is the finish line of the race. Darwin in Australia is a very special place in the minds of a lot of people on our team. It's in the subtropics, so it's hot, it's humid, there's a lot of mosquitoes and other bugs. And then on top of that, there's crocodiles, plenty of dangerous, poisonous things. Uh, we usually set up ourselves in a hostel. The majority of our time in Darwin is spent at a racetrack called Hidden Valley, focused on doing last minute preparations for the race itself. I'm Max Brazen from the Stanford Solar Car Project, and I've been working with the team for about two and a half years. I, I joined actually about exactly a year ago, um, and just the fact that I'm you know, here in Australia now is pretty crazy. In the World Solar Challenge, uh, the teams that uh, place in the top three will actually receive um, recognition and a big medal. So basically, the gold, silver, and bronze teams are kind of the, uh, the top teams the next two years throughout the globe. For the last six or so races, there's been two teams that have uh, traded back and forth winning the World Solar Challenge. The Dutch team, uh, Nuon, uh, and also uh, the Japanese team, Tokai. And then uh, the University of Michigan has also really been in the top three. There's always naturally a little bit of a com competition between Michigan and Stanford. We, <laughs> we were focused on them, we wanted to beat them. Uh, they wanted to beat us, that's a good rivalry. Michigan is a fantastic team, and Michigan provided all the incentive we needed to sort of pull those extra late nights. We were kind of in the dark with respect to Twente. We had gotten to know these guys, and um, they're really funny people. Yeah, definitely one of the fastest teams in the whole race. Very good team, master students. In the Netherlands, they take a year and a half off to do it. They build a beautiful car, race is very fast. 
One of the cool things about our team is that we're completely student-run and involvement is really there to support us, not to direct us. A lot of these other teams are run by professors. They're either completely or mostly grad student uh, composed. And it was really cool for us to see how these other teams are run that were really uh, a lot older than us, a lot more experienced. Right now we're at uh, Darwin Showgrounds where they're staging the event scrutineering where all the teams that are competing in the race this year go Regulation through about checks four. with the officials for the race. Not related to famous Henry Ford by any chance? Not that I know of. It's worth having a look. One of the first stations that our team goes through is a battery check station. Uh, at high noon when the sun is uh, high above the sky, our team will use a solar array to charge those batteries so that at the end of the day and in the early morning when the sun is low in the sky, we can still cruise at the same speed using the extra energy stored in our battery pack. I'm curious to see what other teams have for their battery packs. Uh, most teams keep them pretty under wraps. This was just a station to go through and you put uh, orange to tamper with any cells. Uh, it would be obvious that something had happened. It's just sort of a safety check that they have. The teams are following the rules. Um, hopefully in the course of the race, we'll never open the battery pack again. And we'll open it in Adelaide and the string will still be on, no problems. Thank you very All right. much. It's Thank you. Lovely looking. Thank you. Delighted to see it. So good luck in the event. Great. Thanks. I'm expecting big things of you. <laughs> we'll see. We've been practicing. One of my main projects was building the battery pack mechanically. Uh, Max Pragland did the electronics and Rachel Fenichel did the code. Merry Christmas. Have a battery pack. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, got Full it. Pack. You're fully charged in Darwin and you end the race with an empty pack. So some days later. So you don't discharge to zero every day and you don't recharge to full every day. My other role on the team as of recently has been working on our race strategy and uh, part of that is having good models of the car. So I've worked very carefully to identify how the car performs in different conditions and then use that information to decide how fast we drive the car. If you go faster you're actually burning quite a bit more. Sometimes it'll be better to go uh, faster by one kilometer an hour over a long period of time rather than faster by five or ten over a short period. It depends on what your strategy guys are saying you should do with how it'll run clouds, stuff like that. Three, two, one, go. One of the more fun parts of scrutineering is the driver egress test, whereupon the driver must be seated inside the car with their seatbelt on and get out of the car and I believe it's 12 seconds. So out of the car. But the way it works is you get locked in the car and you have your your harness on and your helmet on and the radio and they give you a countdown. Three, two, one, go. And then the timer starts and you have to get out all by yourself. Get out of the car immediately. Uh, most obvious being some sort of a fire in either the electronics or the battery systems, which do happen. With Luminos, it was pretty easy to get in and out of. Uh, some folks actually have to transform from designers to race car drivers uh, like Anna. Anna Olson, one of the roles that you played in Australia was that of driver. And can you, can you explain for everybody what is the experience like of driving Luminos? One of the most challenging parts about driving the solar car is that it's extremely boring. Your only job is to sit there and keep the car between two straight lines on the road. There's basically no air movement inside the car. You're basically sitting in a little black carbon fiber box. It's, uh, it's definitely unpleasant, um, objectively speaking, but at the same time, um, you're driving a solar car <laughs> across Australia. Um, that part never gets old for me. Our organization has kind of a dual purpose between providing uh, educational experience for the students on the project and making a really high performance vehicle. Should I redesign this? Should I do something new? It would be a little more educational for my members. So really um, navigating the trade-off between good race performance and uh, doing things that are new is probably the toughest challenge. My name is Alex Tilson. I'm a 1992 graduate of Stanford. So I was at the very first meeting that the Stanford Solar Car Project has ever had. Um, it was freshman year, 1989. And no one had built a solar car before. Uh, it's first uh, drive we're doing in Australia. I was the first to take the, 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 the car to Australia and uh, the World Solar Challenge in November of 93, where we were 13th, I believe, out of 40 that started, roughly. And that remained the Stanford speed record across Australia for, for 20 years, much to our surprise. The teams that went subsequently didn't finish. I know at our company, um, our entrepreneurial success, I, I, I partially relate back to the solar car experiences. It taught me a lot as a leader, taught me a lot as a manager, taught me a lot as an entrepreneur, taught me a lot as an engineer. You know, the solar car team and technologies are usually ahead of their time in terms of looking at the next best generation of batteries, the best solar panels, 
best motors and efficient you know, converters, things like that. Most of my involvement with uh, the solar car team was toward the end of when I was at Stanford. I had many friends that were part of that team throughout uh, my time there and I recruited most of the people from the team when we started Tesla. It was a key thing in the beginning of Tesla. I think it matters more than, than most classes you can take. I mean, it's one of the things that even today at Tesla we look at on resumes and place it you know, higher than perhaps GPA or even perhaps you know, higher than you know, what classes they decided here and there. So the process of getting our solar car from basically a blank sheet of paper with um, no ideas yet to having a vehicle that can be ready to race across the Australian Outback takes our team about 18 months. It's a very quick cycle. We'll spend about three months doing preliminary design work once we get to uh, the midfall, we'll start doing some of the manufacturing work. The vast majority of the components in the vehicle we actually manufacture here. The carbon fiber composites, we ramp that up in the late fall going into the winter. Basically the entire vehicle's composite uh, monocoque chassis and exterior shell is made out of carbon fiber. We have a lot of titanium components in the vehicle. We have very high efficiency solar cells on the top of our, of our vehicle and the solar array. And our team usually spends about two or three months doing testing uh, here in California for the most part. For example, we'll spend a lot of time in the Central Valley where there's a lot of open farmland where our team can do testing that's a lot more similar to the Australian Outback. We've also done some wind tunnel testing in the past, even out in uh, North Carolina. Key word for that cycle is testing, testing, testing. We actually put the full length of the race on the car and test miles in the United States, which is a challenge most teams haven't been able to accomplish. This year our team was very fortunate in that we had supported our team. Altogether, the program this cycle had about $1.6 million worth of parts and cash that were donated to our program. Of that, maybe $400,000 was cash. Um, and the rest were parts that were donated to our team. For example, Panasonic was one of our big sponsors this year that provided battery cells for our vehicle. So the Stanford team assembled hundreds of our cells into ver uh, various blocks. Those blocks were assembled into a battery pack and they did uh, all of the integration themselves complete with a battery management system. And this is an amazing effort considering these are young adults, uh, many of them not even officially graduated yet, uh, and uh, being able to pull this off was really, I think, quite magical. Team Micro Electronics uh, that provided a lot of the uh, integrated circuits for our vehicle this cycle. These microprocessors are kind of the center of what our software team works on. And this is a, a little integrated circuit that we use on pretty much every circuit board on the car. The invisible software that just makes everything on the car work and have all the different elements on the car talk to each other. We've been sponsoring it for I believe six years now, okay, and we'll continue to support it because now I'm, we're very involved. Right? It actually goes quite fast. I, mean, I accelerated, I thought I'd scare the crowd by driving at them and they, they got the message, get out of the way. This way. <laughs> it was great, no, it was good fun, good experience. What, what, what I was fascinated by was how they do everything. It's an amazing achievement for undergraduates. They have to still study and get their uh, homework in, as we all know, okay, on time and get their projects done. At the end of the day, it's also a lot of fun. And I think that's what comes across. They really enjoy it and are very enthusiastic. And, and that's it. And, and, and I call somebody get out of companies. There is, you know, there's a method in our madness. You know, we're a European company. We're in the middle of California. What better place to get, become famous is with the next generation of engineers, right? You know, teach, catch them early, as they say. <laughs> So it's, a, it's a fantastic project to be involved in, it really is. It's better than I, even I expected. I mean, people have been telling me about it for years, but now I've been up close and personal, if you like. It's, it's impressive, really impressive. For the, the summer, um, our big deadline in the sand was to get the car in a boat seven weeks before we needed it in Australia. Um, usually our team will ocean ship our car because that's... This last uh, year I tried to make a big effort to try to find a corporate sponsor that could support our team with air shipping. But I had very little success for months on end until I, I got some inroads with uh, Virgin Australia and Virgin Atlantic. Air shipping is something we always talked about doing, but it's, it's hard. And Wesley manages all in the background to get this sponsorship. It reinforces the opinion that he's magical. Wesley was amazing at logistics. So the solar car turn left here. Okay. So the solar car clear to proceed. Beautiful. Greg was great for technical advice, knowledge. Coffee. And they were just both fun people to be around. Coffee. Mm. Coffee. They did a fantastic job. 
So with our passionate, team, strong personalities. Like yeah. Because the thing is, every time water drips out, we're wasting water. Duh. But yeah. fortunately, uh, this year we had a very strongly knit group of students that were out in Australia. Uh, by the time we got to the race, we were really functioning as a well-oiled machine. Okay, well, yeah. the car is still on. Fortunately for us, uh, Stanford University provides cash support, but we still uh, operate on a pretty tight budget when we're, when we're in Australia. We weren't dining out every night, but no, we're not starving. And also, this is partly because the team tries to put most of our money into racing. You can live on pb &J for a while. The one large expense that our team members uh, have to personally uh, cover is the flight ticket to Australia. And for many members of the team, um, that's a barrier that prevents folks from being able to go to Australia to experience uh, racing. In addition to the solar car itself, our team has a convoy vehicles that we use to support the race car. So this year Volkswagen provided us uh, with four vehicles to use and our team picked up those vehicles in Melbourne, Australia. But the first vehicle that we have in our convoy we call the Scout Car. For one, the Scout vehicle is responsible for collecting live weather data just ahead of our team and reporting that back to the rest of the convoy. They'll also report if there's any kind of new road hazards we wouldn't expect. Well, Australia does have a lot of kangaroos, and they're actually primarily nocturnal creatures, so they'll kind of get attracted to this road surface at night when the road is warm and the weather's cooled down a bit. Road trains, these three or four trailer long uh, semi-truck uh, configurations. What they have adopted is, uh, they'll call them Roo Guards, where it's just a steel grate in front of the truck. They won't stop because they can't stop, and they'll just run these kangaroos down. And, and you know, it happens, there's roadkill on the road, and we have to navigate that the next day. The next vehicle in the convoy is called the lead vehicle, and this vehicle will run maybe 500 yards in front of the solar car itself. And then just behind the solar car is the chase vehicle. And the chase vehicle is usually kind of the headquarters of our race convoy. And then the final vehicle that we have in our convoy is our trailer vehicle, which we use to carry all of our tents, all of our camping gear, and also some of our race equipment. All the teams today got a chance to race their cars around the Hidden Valley Racetrack, and the team's racing time on the racetrack uh, is what the officials use to determine the grid order for this year's race. Well, it's a little bit nerve-wracking to be the one doing the hot lap, uh, just because the whole team's kind of <laughs> counting on you. Everyone's worked really hard uh, to get us here. Uh, the Stanford team did very well. We came in with a two-minute, seven-second race time. That was the third fastest in the challenge class. So that means that we'll be placed uh, third car at the start of the grid for this upcoming race. So the day before the race, I felt ready, and I know a number of other people on the team have also felt ready. I've been doing solar car for four years, and this is probably my last shot at it. So today is race day. It's a little surreal to be here. We're all obviously very pumped up, a lot of adrenaline flowing. None of us have slept all night, waking every hour in anticipation of the day. We're just really excited. It's, it's going to be a great race and a wonderful way to see Australia. We hope to win. I'm excited, our team's excited. Uh, feeling good, got a good night of sleep, and uh, we're ready for a long race. You kind of start to reflect a little bit on 18 months of everything. I mean, the, the sleepless nights, the joy of something working, the bickering about what is the best design, what's not the best design, just the, I mean, the agony and the ecstasy of it all. So my uh, parents have decided to come to be the, uh, as they call it, drive the chuck wagon for the team. Like my wife says, we're uh, chief cooks and bottle washers. <laughs> we're making sure that the team stays, uh, stays, stays full. We're the cookies. <laughs> uh, they'll be making our food and just handling the food logistics for the whole trip. Uh, the nice thing about that is it means the team doesn't have to worry about food. They can take a big chunk of work off of the team and leave us to sleep and make sure the car goes really fast. Really excited. It's been a long process, you know, and here we are. The, the door was, you know, at Thanksgiving two years ago was a piece of cardboard and he was, you know, designing it. So it's just fun to see it go from the idea to this. The other guy that came was named David Olson. He was a fantastic asset to have because he knew Outback weather really well. I believe that at the present time we're, we're looking at some bad weather towards the last day, what we hope to be the last day of the race. Um, if we can get there in 
fast enough, we should be able to avoid the worst of it. And then if we don't go fast enough, we could run into some bad weather near Adelaide. With a solar panel, you can see your power drop to near zero with a cloud in front of the sun. And we think that if there's enough sun, that we should be able to have enough energy in our batteries to make it down to Adelaide. Kind of a, a scary game to play when you don't know if you're going to make it to the very end. I'll be driving the first shift, which is exciting, but it's probably one of the more complicated shifts just because you're in real city traffic. The nice thing is I've got, you know, the convoy knows what to do, we're rehearsed at this, we've done this, we're ready to go racing. On the first day of the race, the teams are released off the starting line uh, every 30 seconds or every minute or so. Getting out of Darwin was quite an adventure and there were a lot of teams, it was just very dense traffic, a lot of passing, um, very chaotic. Over the course of the race, there's 9 or 10 control points that teams hit in the biggest cities on the Stewart Highway every few hundred miles. The biggest cities might be a city with a population of 30. As the teams come in, their racing clock will stop for a period of 30 minutes, so teams can buy food and water for the next day of racing, refuel their escort vehicles. So this control point will do a little bit of work on the car uh, that's a little bit superficial, so things like checking for bugs on the array, making sure the tire pressure is okay. Basically, the thing is that you want to evaporatively cool the array and as they heat up, then we start spraying them. We use deionized water or demineralized water because it means that we're not leaving residue on the array. Yeah, okay. getting a little more power than expected. Nuon, which is a team from the Netherlands, uh, their car Nuna 7, has. so these are uh, magnifying devices, and that gets them a lot of extra power. It's legal, you do get a lot more sunlight onto every cell. Nuna and Twente are in front of us. Uh, we passed Michigan a short while ago. Four. Michigan. Yeah, uh -huh. Michigan's way back. They just pulled in. Yeah. So we have pretty good sun coverage right now. There's a bit of clouds, um, but based on our weather data, uh, the clouds should clear up pretty soon, and hopefully we'll have clear blue skies uh, between here and the next control point. As the teams continue for the rest of the day of racing, before they get to the end of the race day at 5 p.m. each day, they'll have to try to scout out a place to spend the night. So what the team will do is quickly pull the vehicle to the side of the road. And then oftentimes what they'll do is they'll take their array of the car, the solar panel, and try to cross the sun for the last uh, final hours of the day. Finally being in the race um, was definitely exciting, although that sort of wore off after the first hour. Um, and then it was just a struggle to, you know, keep wiping the sweat off your face. And <laughs> but it was, it was a good time. Three, two, one, oh. We're fourth now currently. Um, and ahead of Michigan. I got to pass Michigan and looked over and grinned at their car while we were driving by. And as long as we stay in front of Michigan, uh, we'll be happy for now. Michigan no mind. Oh, now Michigan. Well, is Michigan back behind you, Zatra? Uh, yes, Michigan is just down the road a little ways behind us. Oh, we didn't see that. We missed it. Oh, no. Good to know. We set up the array stand, picking a position where we're going to get the most sun that we can. We need to rotate the back of the car closer yeah. to me. What they can say is, okay, I think that you should go up by this amount, and that's kind of eyeballing it based on angles that we can see. All right, that's pretty good. But then after they say, I think we should do this uh, telemetry system, and so we're getting data from the car directly to a laptop. I can see the numbers. Okay, they can say, okay, we're getting five more watts than we had last time, so this is a good angle. Ready for food. <laughs> and then looking forward to the stars out in the outback. That's one of the coolest parts about camping out here.